Thank you for that nice uh, introduction, Nadja, and I would like to thank the organizers to invite me to have this talk. And I'm going to talk about the updated ESPEGAN guidelines for enteral nutrition of preterm infants, and I will try to focus on practical aspects. And here is my disclosure slide. I have received uh, speaker fees from a number of companies and small uh, research funding from Baxter and Prolacta. Uh, as you know, being born very preterm or with a very low birth weight is a nutritional emergency. We know that these babies face numerous nutritional challenges, uh, starting with an almost complete lack of nutrient stores at birth, so they need uh, nutritional support already from the first day of life uh, and they have extremely high nutrient requirements which is easily understood because these babies would normally uh, at least double their weight and in many cases increase their weight by uh, three or four fold during the stay in the in, in NICU or ne neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, furthermore, uh, the prematurity in itself, including uh, morbidities associated with prematurity, complicates uh, parenteral and antral nutrition, making it more difficult to nourish these babies. And uh, the result of these uh, factors, as well as uh, a lack of uh, proper guidelines and education, uh, results in general mal malnutrition and postnatal growth failure still be quite commonly occurring in NICUs in Europe and throughout the world. And why are we worried about that? Uh, well, it's because it's not just growth that it's a problem. Jo growth is just a, a marker. Uh, we are more worried about the health outcomes. So we know that uh, inadequate nutrition uh, is associated with a number of health outcomes, such as severe metabolic disturbances, including, as you know, hypo and hyperglycemia, uh, severe electrolyte disturbances, uh, sepsis, necrotizing androcolitis, osteopenia, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, retinopathy and prematurity, and poor neurodevelopment. So it's really important that we get the nutrition right. And we do have some quite nice and recent European guidelines for pediatric parenteral nutrition, which were published in Clinical Nutrition in 2018, and which are uh, have it was were led by the ESPGAN, ESPEN, ESPR, and CSPAN. And these are for all children of all ages, but they have a very nice uh, inclusion also of preterms. So they're quite useful. However, the enteral uh, guidelines for preterms from ESPEGAN are quite old. They are from 2010. They have been very useful, but it's certainly time for an update. So uh, this is what I'm going to talk about, the updated ESPEGAN guidelines on enteral nutrition. And these uh, uh, are uh, include a review and a very extensive review of all the evidence for enteral nutrition for preterm infants. And the focus is babies with a birth weight less than 1800 grams. And we are not including the post discharge period, but just to stay in the NICU. And the ESPGAN is, as you might know, the ESPGAN Society, the, the European Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition. And many of those involved in the uh, ESPGAN Committee on Nutrition are neonatologists. So there has been quite a lot of focus on uh, neonatal uh, nutrition. Uh, and ESPGAN has uh, appointed a, a writing group consisting of 18 invited experts and in total 25 authors, uh, including committee members. And uh, I must acknowledge uh, Nick Embleton, professor from uh, Newcastle, who has been uh, the project leader. He has done uh, a lot of work in this. Uh, and uh, the whole um, work has been divided into chapters or parts, and each part has one lead author and two to three co-authors. And uh, as you see here from this overview, uh, well, uh, of course, these guidelines are uh, covering the nutrient requirements, uh, which I will come back to. And the old guidelines mostly covered only the nutrient requirements, but these new ones include also sections on feeding practice, clinical management, and diet, uh, which is quite we think is quite useful and which will be the main topic of this talk. Uh, as you see here, the uh, authors are very well spread uh, from different countries in, in Europe, so good, good representation. Uh, 
Uh, and we had an initial small meeting in Oslo in March 2019, and then there was a lot of work going on during the following year. And in February 2020, we had a two-day face-to-face meeting in Amsterdam when all these parts were already, or drafts for all the parts were, were presented. And here you can see us uh, on the 4th of February 2020, and we look quite happy, and we think this is going very well, and what could possibly go wrong? Well, as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic happened. Uh, priorities had to change. Uh, clinicians were redeployed. We uh, were not able to meet face to face and the whole process were, was delayed. But now, September 2021, we can say we are almost finished. We aim to have this published uh, later this year or early next year. And I must uh, warn you that this is not finalized, so you should not uh, use the numbers or uh, quote any of the recommendations that I present here, uh, because it's not completely finalized yet. But this is just quickly the recommendations for fluid and macronutrients. And as you can see, compared to the old guidelines, it's quite similar. Uh, we can, it's almost exactly the same for fluid. Uh, uh, it's a little bit higher for energy, uh, and it's uh, the, inter, the high upper limit has been increased for fat and carbohydrates uh, to uh, accommodate the variation seen also in, in breast milk. So no great changes here. For the essential fatty acids, there was quite uh, only a recommendation for DHA in the old guidelines, and now there are recommendations for uh, several essential fatty acids, and also the uh, recommended intakes are a bit higher based on uh, the recent research. Uh, for the minerals, some of them are exactly the same. Uh, potassium, calcium and phosphorus are higher than the previous guidelines. Uh, and the, the micronutrients, uh, I just mentioned some of them. Uh, most of them are quite similar to the previous guidelines. Zinc and copper intake uh, recommendations is a bit higher. And vitamin D is now expressed per kilogram instead of just per day. So those are some news from the uh, nutrient requirement side. But now I will go into the practical aspects. And I will not be able to present all the huge amount of data and uh, research papers that these recommendations are based on. I will just take one example here, the very nice um, SIFT study. Uh, presented or published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine in 2019. It was a randomized uh, multicenter trial performed in the UK where 2,800 uh, infants uh, less than 32 weeks were randomized to uh, increase their milk or food intakes uh, by 30 milliliters per kilo or 18 milliliters per kilo, uh, starting when they, uh, the clinician um, assessed that they were stable after a couple of days. And uh, the primary outcome was survival without moderate or severe neurodevelopmental disability at uh, 24 months. And as you can see, there was no significant difference in the primary outcome. And importantly, also no significant difference in the risk of sepsis or necrotizing enterocolitis. So this is just one of the great studies that is the basis for these recommendations. So talking about then advancement of feeds or starting with the initiation, uh, there is no clear benefit, uh, beneficial effect of enteral fasting or minimal enteral feeding of any duration compared to advanced feeds immediately after birth. So the recommendation is to start with small, small volume enteral feeds as soon as possible after birth and advanced feeds as clinically tolerated. And then after day four, faster advancement, uh, meaning 30 to 40 milliliters per kilo per day, does not significantly increase the risk of neck or mortality compared to slower. Uh, and, and faster advancement reduces the time to full enteral feeding, length of hospital stay, and possibly the risk of sepsis. So the recommendation in stable preterm infants, where the clinician considers that the feed volume can be increased, uh, we recommend daily in increment of 18 to 30 milliliters per kilogram per day, is, uh, especially in breast milk fed infants. Uh, now to gastric residuals. This has been a, a bit of a controversy because it has, in many units it has been done routinely and, and it has guided the uh, increase of enteral feeds. Uh, but it has been shown uh, 
uh, in studies that gastric residuals alone are not a sensitive or specific indicator for bowel injury of the premature gut. And routine monitoring of gastric residuals uh, actually increases the time taken to reach full enteral feeds and to regain birth weight and increases the number of parenteral nutrition days, but does not have an impact on the neck incidence. So the recommendation is uh, uh, to not routinely monitor gastric residuals in the clinically stable infant. Uh, so we have stopped doing that in our unit a couple of years ago, and I think many units have stopped doing that. However, assessment of gastric residuals uh, should be performed when cl other clinical sites uh, are associated with, with uh, feeding intolerance or neck, such as extreme abdominal distension, tenderness, emesis, bloody stools, uh, etc. So now to the next bit, I should uh, also give credit to Nadia Hayden, our chair here, who has been writing this part of, of the uh, recommendations. Um, this is uh, uh, concludes that early progressive uh, parenteral and enteral nutrition strategies may reduce cumulative energy and protein deficits. Uh, the transition phase between parenteral and exclusive enteral nutrition is a critical time period for cumulative nutrient de deficits and for poor growth. This is quite an in, in, important um, observation. Uh, and the recommendation is that NICUs should develop standardized feeding guidelines and protocols for enteral nutrition. Uh, and now to the discussion about uh, donor human milk and mother's own milk. Uh, we conclude that fresh mother's own milk contains higher amounts of macronutrients and bioactive factors compared to pasteurized donor milk. However, fortified pasteurized donor milk instead of preterm formula reduces neck rates in preterm infants. So there's uh, certainly uh, you can divide them and say that the mother's own milk is the best and then comes the donor milk and then comes the preterm formula. So mother's own milk should be the primary choice of feeding. And in case of insufficient mother's own milk, fortified donor human milk is conditionally recommended over preterm formula in preterms uh, less than 30 weeks or, and, or less than 1500 grams. This is a weak recommendation, but it's based on uh, Cochrane review. There are a number of ongoing studies, so we'll, let's see if that uh, will change in the future, but that's the current recommendation. When providing donor human milk, healthcare providers must continue to increase awareness of the benefit of mother's own milk and uh, give lactation support, of course. Uh, now to fortification, which has also uh, been discussed a bit, especially in, in some countries. Uh, the recommendations from the expert uh, group here is that it's reasonable to use a contemporary multinutrient human milk fortifier to enhance the nutrient content of breast milk given to very low birth weight infants and to start already at uh, enteral intakes of between 40 and 100 milliliter per kilo per day if clinical condition is appropriate. Uh, the use of concentrated high caloric special care products, uh, which you are not intended for preterms instead of fortifier is not recommended. Individualized fortification strategies have the potential to improve growth, uh, but the evidence is still limited. It's recommended to implement preferably as part of a clinical trial or a quality improvement initiative, if you're not already doing it, of course. Um, uh, the exclusive human milk diet and, and the human milk based fortifier is also something which is very much discussed and, and being uh, under, uh, studies are ongoing evaluating this uh, diet. However, uh, the recommendation from the group is that there is not enough evidence to recommend as a strategy to improve short or, or long term outcomes, short term outcomes such as necrotizing enterocolitis, sepsis and death, for example, or long term outcomes. Now to the mode of feeding. Uh, there is not enough evidence uh, that either nasogastric or orogastric feeding tube placement is preferential. So unfortunately, we couldn't resolve that uh, debate. Um, bolus feeding uh, every second or third hour might be slightly more preferential than continuous feeding, but more studies are needed. 
the establishment of non-nutritive sucking prior to the introduction of oral feeding may reduce the time to reach full oral feeding and the length of hospital stay. So that seems to be useful. And the recommendation is to introduce oral feeding or introducing oral feeding should be guided by the competence and stability of the preterm infant and may be started from 32 weeks postmenstrual age. Uh, buccal colostrum has been uh, become quite popular to give uh, unpasteurized colostrum in the mouth early on. And uh, going through the literature, the conclusion is that while the administration of buccal colostrum to premature infants appears safe and theoretically attractive from both an emotional and immunological point of view, no clear clinical benefits for the infant have consistently been proven in high resource settings. And the recommendation is that use of buccal colostrum may be considered in all preterm infants, given that the parents agree. Uh, and uh, that relates to the next point here, uh, pasteurization to avoid uh, cytomegalo infection. And it's interesting to note that the CMV virus looks a bit like the uh, coronavirus. Uh, but it's, of course, a totally different virus. And it's known that this can be transmitted to the preterm infant through the mother's own milk. Uh, so that's a conflict. Should you give the mother's own milk from CV positive mothers or should they be, be tested or pasteurized and so on? So the recommendation is while we acknowledge the potential adverse consequences of personally acquired CV, especially in the most immature infants, there is insufficient evidence to recommend routine pasteurization of mother's own milk from CV positive women as pasteurization reduces the activity of many bioactive factors in fresh uh, mother's own milk. So now to osmolarity. There uh, has been also some discussion about osmolarity and maybe we should test all feeds for osmolarity. It seems that uh, the effect of osmolarity is uh, not as strong maybe as, as has been suggested in some, uh, from some people. Uh, the, uh, but, but osmolarity of milk fish should preferentially be less than 400 milliosmoles per liter uh, and supplements or other feed additives should be added to the largest possible volume of milk feed. Uh, multi-component fortifiers should be used in preference to multiple individual nutrient supplements to reduce osmolarity and hydrolyzed protein formula may be used for enter early enteral feeding in very low birth weight infants because it accelerates uh, gastrointestinal transit and enteral feeding advancement, but no data shows that routine use improves long-term outcomes. So probiotics is not a focus on this in this paper because it has been previously published by the ESPGAN, first uh, a network uh, meta-analysis uh, showing that certain strains uh, of probiotics uh, reduce the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis and then uh, recently published ESPGAN recommendations from last year um, uh, where it is shown that at least uh, two of these uh, promising uh, strains um, can be recommended for preterms less than 32 weeks uh, to prevent necrotizing enterocolitis, but it's important to be good manufacturing practice to make sure that there is no contamination. So there's some caveats that you can read in this paper. So this is just briefly referred to. So what about other uh, bioactive supplements that you can uh, have add to the food and give health benefits? Choline has been discussed because it has been associated with improved uh, neurodevelopment in animal studies and so on. Uh, there is already in the previous guidelines stated that there is a nutritional requirement of between 18 and 55 milligrams per kilogram per day. Routine extra choline supplementation is not recommended in these new guidelines. However, milk formula designed for preterm infants should include choline in concentration to meet the recommended intakes. Uh, and then there are a lot of other bioactive supplements being evaluated, and some of them are uh, listed here, and uh, there is insufficient evidence to support the routine use of those listed here. And some of them is because they have been undergone uh, large randomized controlled trials, and they have not been shown to be uh, effective to improve um, uh, health outcomes, and that includes lactoferrin, 
uh, bile salt stimulated lipase and inositol and then for some other components uh, they seem to be promising but there's not yet enough evidence to support routine use of these supplements and those include milk fat globule membranes nucleotides lutein uh, zeaxanthin and human milk oligosaccharides which will be the topic of the next talk very interesting uh, now to growth uh, growth was a big discussion point and um, one uh, problem is that uh, we, we all use the, the fetal uh, growth as some sort of gold standard, but actually the optimal growth velocity that optimizes outcomes in preterm infants remains unclear because there are no RCTs that we can base this on. Uh, but the recommendations in this um, part is that regular growth monitoring should be performed, weight uh, daily typically, and length and health circumference typically once per week. Uh, growth should be monitored using a growth chart based on a large, robust data set. Here it was a lot of discussion if we should recommend one specific growth chart, but uh, uh, there are some preferences. Some people like one growth chart and some like the other one. And we think that as long as it's not research but clinical work, you, you should just base it on a large, robust data set. For example, the intergrowth 21 is not uh, very good because it includes a very, very small sample size of extremely preterm infants. So it's not very useful in that group. But most other uh, growth charts used for preterm infants are, are, are fine. Uh, the postnatal weight loss should be less than 10% with another year at day three to four. Um, uh, regain of birth weight should be accomplished by day 7 to 10 and then growth should be maintained along or slightly above the current percentile or standard deviation until hospital discharge. So uh, here in this here it doesn't include any recommendation of catch-up growth. However, in small for gestational infants and appropriately for gestational age infants with postnatal growth failure, some catch-up growth should be allowed, but rapid catch-up growth should be avoided. And here we are thinking about minimizing the risk of uh, later on metabolic uh, syndrome, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, etc. Uh, a gradual transition should occur to the corresponding percentile on the WHO postnatal growth chart before or at 44 weeks postmenstrual age. And NICUs should adopt a standardized approach to the management and investigation of growth faltering. Uh, now, this is my last slide here, and I must uh, remind you of the limitations of my presentation here. Many of these recommendations are based on low-grade evidence. Some of them are based on very nice randomized control trials and all, but many of these recommendations, unfortunately, still low-grade evidence. Uh, this is a consensus of 25 experts after going through a vast amount of literature, including the very most recent papers. Uh, this is um, labeled as a position paper. It's not a formal guideline or protocol, so you all have to do your own guidelines and protocols more locally. And you can, of course, uh, go through the evidence for yourself. We encourage you to do that. Uh, I would not like you to use the presented data here as written because uh, phrasings are more, have been modified by me here for brevity and also changes may occur before, before publication. So thank you very much for your attention. And I would like to acknowledge once again, Professor uh, Nick Ambleton, who was the project leader. Thank you very much.